Hi, my name is Julia, and on this YouTube channel, I make videos about art, museums, and books. However, recently I encountered a video game that proved me once again that art is not limited to museum halls, white cube galleries, and pages of the exhibition catalog. In one of my previous videos, I talked, for example, about internet art, which belongs to the internet space. Today I want to talk about another digital medium, which can be enjoyed on your computer or your console. But before I begin, I have to briefly disclose my experience with video games in general. I can't consider myself a professional gamer, let alone a video game critic. I'm easily turned off by a game if it's too complicated or if it's too scary, for example. I'm never up for a challenge, um, well, because I don't have time for that. I do enjoy simulation games such as The Sims or Tropico. I really enjoy the freedom of creating my own storyline, my own characters or, well, the whole country. I've completed several splendid games such as Grand Theft Auto V or Zelda Breath of the Wild and I enjoyed every moment of it. My main point of fascination is the world or environment game designers create. I do appreciate how they build landscapes and path in which one travels while playing. But I can assure you, you don't even need this amount of experience for the game I'm about to introduce you. The skill set for playing this game is actually very similar to viewing visual artwork. Be ready to read a lot, be ready to think critically, and be ready to listen to your own guts. Without further ado, let's begin with none other than Disco Elysium, the final cut. An award-winning and critically acclaimed Disco Elysium was first released in 2019. A year later, in 2020, creators introduced an expanded and remastered version uh, titled Disco Elysium The Final Cut. The key game designer, Robert Kurwitz, created a self-sufficient world populated with a kaleidoscope of elaborately written characters and connected all of them through one unhinged policeman who is trying to decipher the murder mystery. I'll guide you through three aspects that are worth your attention while playing the game, starting with one that strikes you immediately – visual art and environment. We find our main character amid the ruins of the fictional city of Revachol, which is struggling to recover in the aftermath of the revolution and civil war. The artist managed to complement this story with the outlook of the surroundings. Cracks on the pavements, remains of the concrete structures popping up now and then, abandoned flats and collapsed rooftops. Everything screams about the troubled past that, although has ceased a long time ago, never actually left the city. It's also ironic that the main public artwork, according to the game lore, is not just left in a state of ruin, but was actually commissioned to contemporary artists who chose to install it this way. It's really a decision to keep the whole environment record. First, it animates the history of the fictional city, so for players it's easier to perceive it. Second, it creates a unique and distinguished environment in comparison to other games. And third, the ambience of the city corresponds with the struggles of the characters in question. This is an old trick that artists and writers exploit for their advantage. Perhaps the most successful in this endeavor are Dostoevsky and Dickens. In their novels, St. Petersburg and London, respectively, are practically additional characters. The description of the city in Crime and Punishment is matching the psychological state of Raskolnikov and arguably drives him crazy. Dickens portrays London and its locations often as dangerous and poisonous place for his characters. Ravishol and Disco Elysium has the same role, its hostility infects the inhabitants of the city and, consequently, its guests. This idea of distress is also executed in supporting images, such as portraits of the characters or illustrations of thoughts, for instance. Lines and outlines are distorted and twisted just like lives of our characters. Colors clash and mix akin to the narrative that confronts different cultures and political views. It seems as if the artist primed the digital canvas not with white or black, but rather with that water in the glass in which one washes used brushes, you know, the one where all colors are blended in one undistinguished, dirty and depressing substance. That one. The whole environment is untidy, messy, and despite its abstract nature, 
painfully real, just like life itself. Yet, as I said, this artistic choice doesn't distract you from the narrative. On the contrary, it immerses you in one of the most sophisticated worlds ever created. For that, my applause to the artistic team of Disco Elysium. Speaking of which, while artists can satisfy the eyes of even the most spoiled players, the underlying story will leave even the most experienced readers compassionate and concerned. I don't want to spoil anything, there's a, indeed a lot to unravel and again, you can play this game several times and every time you will have a unique experience. You have all the possibilities to change the character, turn him into the drunken asshole or step on the righteous path and find closure. And of course, no matter how you decide to change your poor detective, it will always be unfolded in the dystopian, noir-like world packed with mind games, psychological manipulations and the mysteries of subconscious. Occasionally authors surprise you by dropping fancy words, but overall the language is very accessible. Again, since narrative is delivered through quite realistic dialogues, it makes it easy to follow the investigation. Though, to my taste, it was a bit difficult to learn about the world itself through these dialogues, but I think the reason is that I'm an amateur sci-fi appreciator and for me it's just genuinely hard to perceive and imagine a world different from our own. On the other hand, my interest in history and uh, historical processes helped me to digest the relatively perplexing background of the city. The leading writer of the game, Helen Hinper, says that number of words they produce for all possible scenarios and conversations of uh, the story totals to million words. That is like two times war and peace in English. But don't be scared, first of all, you will not encounter all these words in one save, and secondly, they're beautifully animated with the gorgeous voices of the actors. A shaggy looking girl in her late teens or early twenties kneels on the ice with an electronic contraption in her hand hearing you approach she looks up oh hello there it's cold out here but she's not wearing a hat she must be freezing on top of that it is accompanied by the soundtrack specifically created for the game by the british band sea power <laughs> So it's not a dry narrative you have to deal with, on the contrary, it's a high quality production that instantly makes you believe all the characters. What's more important, it never lets you down and never feeds you unnecessary information, even when it seems it does. Last but not least, I want to talk about one of the most distinguished features of this game, the skill system and the thought cabinet. And that brings us to the discussion of what I want to call an epistemological challenge in video games. It's been a long time since philosophers started to occupy their minds with the questions like, how do we know that we know things? How do we acquire knowledge? How do we know that it's true or not? They called it epistemology, the knowledge about the knowledge. Game developers are puzzled by the similar questions every day. At the beginning of the game, we as players have no premises. We are, if you will, tabula rasa, a blank slate that has to acquire knowledge about this new world we interact with. They have to introduce you to the narrative and the rules, tell you who you are and what you're capable of, and last but not least, explain how to control your abilities. In game design, this process is sometimes referred as the learning curve. Different games solve this problem differently. They might give you short tutorials, send you to talk to people where you explain what happened to somebody else or where you are told what's going on. Perhaps the most convenient solution is to make your character forget who they are. Convenient because it equals you 
with the character. Take for instance Link in Zelda, Bayonetta and Witcher, just to name a few, who woke up after some sort of hibernation and you are forced to figure out the world around them. This is exactly what happens to your character in Disco Elysium. He wakes up in the hotel room with no documents, no clothes and what's worse with no recollection on what he's doing there. It becomes a goal in itself to find out who he is. You acquire this knowledge by talking to other people, making observations and finding certain artifacts. So as I said, it's a rather simple solution, however, the creators of Disco Elysium converted this basic epistemological problem into the feature that makes this game so special. First of all, apart from the standard physical skills such as endurance or strength, which are very typical for other games as well, our character in Disco Elysium might develop more mental, psychological or sensorial skills such as logic or authority for instance. So it's not just about how fast you can run or how violent your hits are, but also how you can distinguish lies from the truth or how persuasive you can be. Additionally, the thoughts and ideas you encounter throughout the game may affect the abilities of your character. I can imagine that this new expanded skill system opened up a lot of doors for writers to lead the story in various directions and yield, in some cases, different results. Secondly, from the very beginning we realized that our skills are basically additional characters, which often enter the dialogue, interrupt your thought process, bring your arguments, help or distract in your attempt to solve the crime. That is an absolutely ingenious solution and goes beyond the initial problem of introducing players to the game. It simply becomes the game. In some cases, it allows you to continue or, on the contrary, prevents you from the story progression. It is the first time that a video game made me think of how exactly we interact with the world, what led us to make conclusions, decisions and assumptions. For me, it became nearly a philosophical experience. Again something that very often happens to you when you see the great work of art. In conclusion, I want to express just two things. My gratitude to the creators and my recommendation to you. So dear creators of Disco Elysium, thank you very much. My introduction to this game assured me once again that art can be enjoyed in many different ways and direct interaction with the character and the story of a game can be truly a transcendental experience. And now you, dear viewer, I know how difficult it can be to understand and see art. Let Disco Elysium be a great metaphor of the art itself, a detective story in search of a vase of truth. I can recommend it to everybody, especially those who are skeptical about the ability of video games to deliver a sophisticated art experience. That's it for today, and thank you very much for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one very, very soon. Goodbye.